Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 359th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today's episode welcomes a very special guest to the show. I want to first extend a thank you to a listener and longtime reader of the blog and this podcast, Pamela, who reached out to me earlier this year and suggested, you know, you might want to reach out to our guest today. I know she still does interviews. I know she still speaks in lectures. Um, she would be a good fit for your podcast. You, you talk and you write about the same topics. And so it began with this email, an email that I have received actually many times before from other listeners and readers, but because my life with regards to two years ago and beyond was so full and so busy, I wasn't able to explore the possibility of this opportunity. And so I appreciate, Pamela, you, you reaching out and suggesting that I invite Alexandra Stoddard onto the Simple Sophisticate because that is who our guest is today. For those of you who have read all some, reread all some of her now 28 books that she began writing in 1974, you know exactly who I am talking about. If you hear that name and you don't know who Alexandra Stoddard is, that is okay. She is someone who began her career as an interior designer in New York City and eventually founded her own firm in Manhattan for many years. And it was a book that she wrote in 1974, Style for Living, How to Make Where You Live You, that... Well, I'll let her explain exactly how that book that she wrote in her 30s sparked what turned into a lifetime of being an author, a lecturer, and yes, a philosopher on how to live well. I am so excited to welcome to this show Alexandra Stoddard, who at the age of 81, we spoke earlier in May, just a couple weeks ago, was a breath of fresh air, full of energy and exuberance and excitement about life and all that comes with it. And because of her many years, she is living proof that it's how you choose to live, not just because you've lived, that you can continue to live an amazingly rich and fulfilling life. I'm going to break this episode up into two parts. There are no ads to interrupt us, but I will take a one minute intermission about halfway through just to give you time maybe to refill your cuppa or stretch your legs or whatever it is you just maybe process all that she's going to talk about. But this first half, we're going to talk about what she believes is her life's work. We'll talk about saying no, 
not only to other people, but also to ourselves and what that means and how that helps us live a more fulfilling life. And why self-love is not selfish and what it is exactly that is necessary for us to live a life that is fulfilling. Alexander will also talk about in this first half of the program how to welcome more energy into our lives and what that looks like. And she will be the first to admit, and she does in our conversation, that there'll be moments where I'll ask a question and She'll start it and she will expand and share an anecdote and detail that anecdote. But she comes back every time and finishes the question with a beautiful response that will leave you pondering. So that's the first half of our conversation. So let's get to it. In 1986, my guest book, Living a Beautiful Life, 500 Ways to Add Elegance, Order, Beauty, and Joy to Every Day of Your Life, was published and became a bestseller that began a journey of offering her wisdom, encouraging us to all live more personally fulfilling and beautiful lives. Now philosopher of contemporary living and author Alexandra Stoddard, has written 28 books over the past 45 years. She's been interviewed by Barbara Walters, Jane Pauley, and Katie Couric, with appearances on Oprah, Good Morning America, and The Today Show. And she continues to share how to live a life of contentment in the everyday. She is joining me this afternoon from her home in Connecticut, and I am so grateful that you said yes, Alexandra, to this invitation to join us today. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, Alexandra Stoddard. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. I'm so happy to be with you and among your wonderful fans. Oh, I sincerely appreciate your time today. And uh, I want to begin, as I was rereading your book on tea ceremonies and the serenity that it can bring into our lives, you shared that you realized that life could be art at a very young age. And your age, you were 17. You were on this international trip with your aunt, Aunt Betty. And that's who the book is dedicated to. Can you talk us through how you knew at such a young age that life can be art? And what does that mean? I really knew that life was art when I was three, when I became conscious in my mother's flower garden. I, Before I could read or write, I didn't even know. All of a sudden, I was in this paradise. And, and, and I wrote about it really lovingly in my book of color, Alexandra Stoddard's book of color. But nature is art. We are in this wondrous, wondrous universe. We are alive. This is just really exciting. And I want people to wake up. And I woke up when I was three. Some people are five. Some people are two. I don't know. But I had this awakening. Some people have horror stories about their beginning of life. I had this paradise. This life is life is so beautiful. All we have to do is wake up and use our sensual gifts that we've been given, our five senses and our intuition. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, the senses. The senses, you really dove into that in your writing. Oh, because I'm a sensualist. Everything is exciting to me. And and, and I'm tactile. I I love to smell, touch, feel. It's just, it's just, life is alive. Why do I care? Because it's adding on to the joy. If I can feel better, then I'm exuding more energy. And we are energy machines. We are 97% energy. And the rest, the little physical part of us is sort of, um, it changes every eight, eight, eight years anyway. We are here to exude energy and give back to the universe for what they've given us trees, flowers, they communicate. I'm communicating love. This is what it's all about. Life is art. Life is love. Life is to be exciting all the time. Now, when I say all the time, I mean, yes, we are in a, in a challenging world, but are we going to add to the, to the misery or are we going to add to the joy? Are we going to show the light, emphasize the light that's available to us? It's springtime. It's beautiful. Enjoy it, embrace it, love it, and love, love being human. Right. Well, and I love that you're saying that, that, that what fuels us, what brings us energy to invest more of in time and energy into that. And, 
and to not invest our time in things that are depleting and to know the difference. How do we figure out the difference? And you spoke to it in those examples, but maybe someone's listening to us going, okay, but I have to do my job and I have to do these things. What can they shift the perspective, the, the, the train of thinking? What is it everything? They need to... Okay. Every, excuse me for interrupting everything. No, go for In it. other <laughs> words, you don't have to do anything. Stop in your tracks. Pause. I, I study mindfulness. I'm a stoic. I've been studying philosophy. I never stopped studying philosophy. The word happiness makes me giddy. I, 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 I have a tingling sensation. I don't talk about goosebumps. I talk about soul bumps. I feel my body is alive. And, 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 and when the truth, the truth is the prize. When I'm excited about something, there's something that I have to pay attention to. We should be paying attention all the time, but even the sages don't pay attention all the time. We, we pay attention in, in, in little snippets of time. The light comes on our flower bouquet and we say, ah, ah, divine light, the, a beautiful sunset, the sunrise. But we should be more mindful. But we, if we, if we choose happiness, and this has been my life's work so far, and believe me, I'm not finished. My, <laughs> it's, it's a process. Life is a process. But if we can want and really want to embrace happiness, if we choose it, if we choose happiness as our way of being, it's a journey. It's a skill. We have to practice it. Every single thought we have before we utter any words from our mouth, the 26 letters in the alphabet, there's thousands of words in the English language. You speak French. There are other languages all over the world that are communicating to us. Do you want to do you want to embrace life? If you have one word in your obituary, is it going to be love or is it going to be hate? Is it going to be positive or is it going to be negative? Are you going to lift people up or are you going to drag them down? We have situations in our lives. I don't call them problems. Don't elevate them. They're situations, and we have to. We are challenged every single day of our lives. One time, three times, twenty-five times doesn't matter. You never know when the phone's going to ring, the bad news, whatever it is. And and are you ready for that? You have to be from one to ten. Do you have to? I don't want to rate our happiness. It's a it's a process. But if you want to elevate your happiness, be around people that support your journey. Be around people that don't knock you down, don't judge you. We're all different. If we were alike, we wouldn't learn anything from anybody else. I am right now wanting to be a better human, a better human being. To be better, to, to, to achieve excellence in this journey, I have, to, I have to have values. I have to have a moral compass. I have to have love be my, my mantra. And I want to give back to this beautiful, beautiful world that I've been born into. I don't know if my parents wanted me or not, but I'm here, baby. <laughs> I'm here to have fun. <laughs> And, 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 and I get letters from my readers, and I tell you, I don't even remember the bad letters I get because people have to, for me, I'm very different than everybody else. I understand that, but you're different than everybody else also. We have gifts. We have, we have genetic, genetically inherited gifts. We've been given our ancestors. We've been given their sunshine and their light and their truth and their beauty, and we go through our to the present, we've been born, and then we nurture through our environmental experiences. My trip around the world, world was pivotal because my aunt had all the right values. She was international. She had diversity. She wanted everybody to, 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 to be lifted up. She didn't want world hunger. She didn't want people to be ignorant. She wanted everybody to, to, to have an opportunity to live with dignity and grace and love. And she influenced me. She took three of her oldest nieces around the world. There was a message. She was a woman. She could have gotten married, but it didn't kind of work out. So she, she the world was her living room. And she had friends of both sexes all over the world. And and she she was the light and the truth. And, and so... She lives with me every single day, and I'm very, very blessed. Not everybody has an Aunt Betty. She never earned more than $13,000 in a year. 
She was an international social worker. She gave back to others. She trained other people. She taught other people. She was a born teacher and an educator. And she, she died very young. It was the first big death I ever experienced. She was 60, in her early 60s. And I was supposed to have lunch with her that day. And she was giving a lecture at the United Nations, had a heart attack, was in the hospital, called me the night before. I didn't know that she called 54 other relatives and, and family members and friends to say, what are you doing? Are you writing your book? How are the children? She just was always encouraging me. And I would say, oh, Aunt Betty, you know, it's hard to find the time. She said, you have to find the time. You have to find the time. Because I, was, I had a full-time job as an interior designer. I was raising little children, taking them to school, picking them up. And, you know, I wasn't giving up motherhood just because I loved my career. Right, 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 right. I was earning money. I had to support my family. You had to. Yeah. No, I'm glad you're sharing all of this. And I want to make sure everyone knows your aunt's name. Her name is Ruth Elizabeth Johns. And uh, thank you for introducing all of us to her a little bit more as you do throughout your books ever so. An generally. unknown hero. An unknown hero. I, I, I want to speak to this idea of rituals because a lot of what you're talking about are, are, are concepts that are spread throughout our everyday, like your aunt, her rituals of different things that she would do. I mean, the fact that she, what she valued, it comes through in our rituals. But I thought this was so powerful for me anyway, as I was reading through your books again, especially your first book. Your very first chapter is about rituals, which tells me that that is very important. And it runs throughout the entire book. And I would like you to just kind of speak to the idea of why rituals are so important. Um, you write, I want to share a quote here. You write, I've become convinced that only by paying careful attention to simple details of daily tasks and to our immediate surroundings can we live vitally and beautifully all the days of our lives. It takes a commitment to enjoy each day fully. Can you first define what a ritual is? And then also, why is this to be true? Why are rituals so powerful in elevating our life to, full, to, full, to let us live contentedly? I think... I think life is divine. I think that it's sacred. So a ritual is elevating. It's, it's setting a pretty table, not, not for other people to see, not for the Joneses, but to dignify your own life with grace. My aunt, I was little. I had tiny little toddlers. What did I do when, I, when Aunt Betty died? I had a sauna. I took my children to have ice cream. We had ice cream, chocolate ice cream, uh, sprinkles, and everything all over our, their, their little pinafore dresses. But I remember, and I was crying through my, my smiling because I, I, I really believe that rituals dignify our life, give us grace. And I'm, I meditate, and I, I, I try to be mindful. And believe me, I mess up every single day. But then I go right back to the mat. The mat means. Wherever I am, wherever I am, I'm on the mat. It's an attitude. It is an attitude. It's so true. And I, I appreciate you sharing that, sharing that you meditate. Can you explain to us what it does for you? What is it, what is it that that brings into your life by meditating? Well, it brings me to my life because my only life is right now, this very second. I breathe in. Okay. The yeah. present moment. And to be present is to be. Lao Tzu, 500 years before Jesus Christ was born, said the sage, the Chinese sage, said the way to do is to be. If you, everyone is so busy and they're going to get ready for nothing, an automobile accident, forgetting where their car keys are. I have a friend that put her car keys in the in the, the freezer because she was unpacking her groceries, thinking about a million things. We all do that. We all and so. A ritual is something you do to elevate the moment. And it doesn't have to be a big ritual. Now I want, I want to add the ritual and the meditation. You can have a walking meditation. I can walk into the kitchen, but I walk through some flowers on a table. I have a ficus tree that's huge because I water it and love it and talk to it. I can go buy a gardenia that's in bloom. And I can kiss it, but not too much, not too tightly, 
not too juicy <laughs> because, because I don't want it to get brown. But I, if a new bud is on one of my rose little plants, I, I whoa, or a little tiny on my thigh. In my bedroom, I have a ficus tree, but I have a, 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 a humidifier. And I, I tell all my friends, listen, if you want to have a facial every day, get a humidifier in your bedroom because you turn it on at night and then in the morning your face is all looking aglow with a little a little added moisturizer and you're all set. Look, I'm 81. Come on. That's not too shabby. So why not? And my facelift is, is my happiness. It's right here. There you go. That's what it is. There you go. No, it's, thank not you for <laughs> it's not a band-aid. It's not a band-aid. It's not a band-aid. And I would never have anyone cut me up. I, I listen. If I if I get a boo boo, I don't like bl- looking at my own. I mean, I I don't want any problems. But I I just want to tell you that that it's 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 it, happiness is something that shows on your on your in your whole body language, your face, everything. It and, and it's good for your health. It's just good for your health. So it's so it, it, it you have to be you have to center yourself. You, you, I'm getting off the subject about rituals, but, but, but ritualize your whole life. And all the things that you have to do to work, you have to work because you're, you're here to, 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 to serve others and, and, and to, to, to take care of yourself. You can't right. give if you, from an empty vessel. You vessel. have to give you have to fill it up. Yeah. Well, and to fill that vessel, I want to talk about um, one of my readers pointed out that she loves your book, Daring to Be Yourself, and she's reread it multiple times. And I, too, generally just really appreciate your words in that book. Well, what one of the things you say is you have to be willing to say no and trust that you don't know what's going to happen and know that that everything's going to to work out in a way you may not expect, but it might show you something that you need to know. Can you talk through how to dare to be yourself in the sense of trusting the unknown and letting go? Well, anyone that pretends they know something about two hours from now is got to be a little bit. Ooh, I mean, come <laughs> on, you, you you can plan your life away and and plan your children's future and everything, but they're going to surprise you. Believe. Me. They're going to marry somebody that you, you know, really, <laughs> you know, things happen. That's why I, I listen, I, I wrote, I wrote, I had two single daughters and I wrote a, a book uh, to, to my two daughters because I thought if, if I published a book, they'd read it. But if I said, no, I want to tell you, you know, over tea. <laughs> um, no, it's just, it's so fascinating to me. So going back to what were we talking about? I, no, no, that's okay. That's I appreciate. You I, I just that. love being with you. That's all. I feel <laughs> I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, no, no. I, this is for this is just to spotlight you. So I, this idea of, of daring to be ourselves, and I speak about this too, is to trust the letting go, to not control and let go, and just dance. I like to say dance with the universe, to to be a participant, but not a. Oh, well, it is a dance. So we, we, yeah, we move. We know. How do we get, yeah. How do we find comfort in that? How, what, what, what can someone maybe, what would you, well, what would because, you suggest? Because yeah. you do your best and leave the rest. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do but your best. And how many of us really do our best all the time? We do our best sometimes. We do it our best in spots. But then we're, we're, we kind of, maybe we think of a dark thought. We don't understand that a thought is going to manifest badly in ourselves. There you go. So, how dare power. to be yourself? And then you talked about the art of no, the art of no, and the, and um, I, I wrote several books, the art of no. In fact, when my literary agent Carl Brandt was dying, I, I revisited that, and he said, I don't think that's going to fly. I tried over many, many, many years to to write a whole book about the art of no leads to the joy of yes, because I know that it's what I don't do in my life that brings me my greatest rituals, my greatest meditation, my greatest mindfulness, my greatest happiness because I do my research. I can't be with other people and talk and listen and be attentive to them and and write books or prepare for a, or a talk that I'm giving that's really meaningful to me. I have to study I have study hall really early in the morning 
And when friends think that there's that my inner circle and I can call me at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, that's not fair to me because it chops into my four or five hours of studying. Now, people want, people want to go to college. I think it's a great idea. Frankly, I would have loved to have gone college to go to college. I had a scholarship ready for me, but I went around the world and I didn't want to go back into a schoolroom and have a teacher that might not be as <clears throat> wonderful as Aunt Betty <laughs> or, or, or said, so I decided to study the whole universe and, and, and keep reading my existentialism, keep studying all the books that I got excited about. And the trip around the world made me care about being human and thinking about empathy and compassion. And then I got all excited about the Dalai Lama and Buddhism. And everything. But all of that leads it was from daring to be yourself. It all leads to, to a path, a journey. A process and it's every single day it's accumulative we don't become wise overnight and believe me I know a lot of people my age they're not wise they're not <laughs> choosing happiness they age choose to complain to you that. <laughs> how, do, how do you feel when somebody complains to you you want to squeeze them I mean you, you want to you want to you, you in a loving way you want to hug them and just say there's so much there's so much you have and you can give, you could, so Dr. Manager said, leave your house, walk across the railroad track and find somebody, somebody you can serve. You just, you, you never can be unhappy when you're giving to other people and you daring to be yourself is you don't give to other people when you say, I have to do this and I have to do that. And I, 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 I I'm so self-important because I'm giving to to this hospital or I'm giving to this fundraiser. No, you don't have to brag about your giving. You do it because it's it's it's, it's part of your joy to 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 contribute. And and you do it in your own way. My I, I have the art spirit. I think that for me to surround myself with 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 beautiful art and to and color and beauty and, and share that with my friends and family and anyone else that is interested. Uh, that's really what my living a you know live a beautiful life. Five hundred ways to add elegance. Elegance? That's not rubbish. Order. Order precedes beauty. I mean, you have to be fairly orderly, but not a perfectionist. Right. Not. And you speak to that. Not to the point of minimal minimalism. Yeah. Right. But but I, I love you. I love you combining daring to be yourself and no. Because you dare to be yourself by saying no, not to others, but to yourself. No, I'm not going to be just, I'm not going to be superficial. I'm not going to do stupid things, take my time. You know, going to the grocery store for one, you know, one thing that you forgot just because you know that you're going to need toilet paper tomorrow and Kleenex. Or, or so, it, it, you don't have to wait, fill your time and then be frazzled all the time. Are you escaping from yourself? No, you have to be with yourself 24 hours a day. No, I appreciate you saying that um, because I wanted to ask this question about, and you just described what you do um, as well, giving yourself time in the morning. But you say that it's so important for all of us to have time in our own company, to spend time on our own with ourselves alone. And you're, you're speaking to an audience that have, are living all sorts of different lives. Some of us are, are married. Some of us have children. Some of us are child-free. Some of us have chosen to be single. I mean, there's a widow, divorce. We've all lived different lives. But you say we all need to find time to be on our own and be comfortable with ourselves. Can you speak to how, how, it is, how this is so important? Why our own company, feeling comfortable with ourselves, is so important and how that lends to more contentment? Let's look at our lives. We're born naked. We're thrust into the, wor to the world That's in, in different ways. We're, we're, we don't even know how to walk. We cry when, 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 when we're hungry. Or, and then we, 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 we go into awkwardness in youth. How do we go through from birth to death? How do we travel through that journey? I was young, poor, or had to earn my own way, uh, scholarships, 
Uh, my father didn't believe he was a nice man, but he was he was a man, and he didn't believe in women being educated. So he his two sons, not his daughters. So you know, I had to struggle to find my way to dare to be myself. So you dare to be yourself during all these different life uh, changes and the natural evolution of our lives. And by being true to yourself, how can you do that if you don't love yourself? And people think that self-love is selfish, but we talked earlier about it's, it's being centered. If I am needy, then I'm being a burden to my children, my, my loved ones, my friends. They, they, don't want, they don't want me to be needy. They want me to be happy. So I married when I was a teenager because I was <clears throat> a virgin. I mean, I was really... Uh, my mother was very strict. No, what happens in our lives is very, very unusual. It's, it's not a popularity contest. We make certain choices that are very personal. We don't have to share every single choice we make. With your diver diverse followers, I've had some followers of my own. Do you really think that we can please everybody else if we don't please ourselves? The only way that I can have a true follower is for the follower to know that I am being sincere. I am honest. I am living my life with as much honesty and integrity as I can. And boy, is it not wonderful for everybody. And that's okay. I'm a writer because I, I, I think, I think that writing makes me more true to myself. Yesterday, I was with a friend, and we were on tr three different train rides going to a museum, and I, I was writing a letter to a, a friend, and, and I, she was reading, and I just, no, I, 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 I don't mind writing in front of other people, but it's a little weird. I mean, I like being by myself when I write, because it's a love letter, and, 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 and I want you to know that, that in, my, in my books that I've written, I'm not ashamed of any of those books that I've written, but I want to tell you there's a lot there's a lot that I haven't published that I think and feel that was unpublishable or or was I mean I I I love laughing at the whole process of of getting a book published because you've got an editor and you've got a public then you go to public you got to get a publisher that wants it to see a five to six editor then they have to approve it. And then you have a literary agent, and everybody has an opinion about what, what, what's going to sell, and, and it's just nobody knows, but it doesn't matter. But whatever. But the fact that I was able to, 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 to get 28 books that I'm happy about in the pipeline. And by the way, Living a Beautiful Life wasn't my first book. Style for Living: How to Make Where You Live You. Is, is, is the book that came out with a double day, and that was what got me on the Today Show with Barbara Walters. So I was an unknown decorator and unknown everything, and, and I wrote this book because I wanted people to be themselves. And so later I wrote the book, Daring to Be Yourself. But what's, what's fascinating to me now, looking back, is that I have, I have been pretty true to my message since I was very young. Well, that's what I was noticing as I'm reading and rereading your books is there is a the themes are the same, at the, whether you talk about them directly, because it has to do with that particular book, or it's just indirectly part of the of the journey of the book. Your themes about contentment, about mindfulness, about living beautifully, about being present, all of them continue in some form or fashion, either directly or indirectly through all your books. And I guess I, I consider you the doyen of this contentment idea, this idea of living in the present, of as you talked about in our entire conversation so far, about being present, savoring all the sensualities of life and everyday life. And I'm curious, I'm curious if, you know, has anything changed or have you tweaked anything over the journey of, you know, 45, 50 years of this discovery, or is it pretty much steady and true? Um, be, be present, be in the moment. Has it changed? That, you, that people don't have to be physically alive to be present in your life. That's what I learned from Aunt Betty. She's with me every single day, all because I'm, because I'm so fortunate to be 81. 
No one in my family ever lived to be 81. My sister died a few years ago of, of breast cancer, and she was 80. So I've lived longer than anyone in my life. And I want to just say to you that it's a wonderful, wonderful gift to realize that you are given this longevity for a reason. There's a reason you're here. You're not here just to be drooling and, 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 and have other people have to care for you. I mean, it happens. It, 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 who knows? We're just lucky when we're able to get up in the morning excited to make our bed and make up our mind to live a beautiful life. There's beauty everywhere, and it inspires the best in us. And we have to, to, to find the beauty. Beauty is a spiritual energy, and it's physical. It's, you can see it. You can smell it. You can touch it. You can taste it. It's, it's, just, it's just a wonderful thing. When, when people talk about eating clean, well, yes, it, it, it's physiological. It, it, woo! It's, you feel it. You feel better. You feel better, you're better for yourself. And I want to go back go for just for it. a second yeah. to the rituals. Oh, good. Yeah. Instead of having cho- instead of having chores, I wrote a book that I really, really love called Grace Notes. And it's a daily meditation. I love that book. came out around 31 or 32 years ago. And people are still reading it around the world every single day. They're reading a Grace Note. And then I, I it's by... Shakespeare or Gerd or some philosopher, Aristotle. And then I add, as people that I admire. And then I add to that my little grace notes, and then I have a space for you to write your own grace notes. Well, guess what? The wonderful thing is that the more affirmations you have in your life, the more grace you have. Grace is a gift, it's given to us. Can you talk what grace looks like in life? What is that? What is grace to you when you, cause it's a concept and I, and I know that people have ideas of their own, but when you say grace, what do you mean? You and me being together. Th- those moments of aha, uh, it, it, it's just, you turn a corner, you're, you're taking a walk and, and you go down the street and all of a sudden cherry blossoms in full bloom. You, you, you see a child and, and, and the child's looking the ice cream, and you think of your own childhood. I mean, grace is everywhere, but you have to receive the grace. Oh, okay. It's okay. a gift. I appreciate that. So you have to be present. You have to be aware. Well, how many people are really present and aware that life is divine? Why are we here? We're human animals. You see, we we're given a conscious. We have we we have a free will. We we can we can make choices, but so little is in our control. If we can control our mind and our heart, our spirit, then 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 we holistically can become wiser and more excellent at being human. Aristotle, my my favorite philosophy philosopher, who taught about happiness. He was my first. Yeah, he he was the one that I started studying when I was a teenager, when, and I took him around the world with me, in book form, and uh, but he but he's part of me now. He's in my DNA. I mean, he's totally inside my my myself. A good man to have, yeah. <laughs> he's a good he's a good guy to hang around with. But uh, he 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 taught about happiness, and he said you have to be a good person, and then happiness just comes. But you have to practice being a good person. So there's a discipline to it. It's it's, it's, it's what you value. It's it's your everyday thing. And you 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 can't you don't get um, law degrees or medical degrees for humanities. But if you study good minds throughout history, I mean thousands of years ago and move forward. Um, there's a, the, the humanities is important if you're if you're a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief. It's very important to not just have your own mind and soul inform you or your friends, your contemporaries. But this is a we've been around for a long time, and we have to we have to broaden our understanding of it's our time now. And so when you were talking earlier about about all the different people in our lives, we've got, I have children that follow me. I have great-grandmothers. 
I have great, I mean, it's a beautiful thing because I'm, I've been here for a while and I can tell you how wonderful it is to have this continuity, to have this flow of energy go from, from people that followed me 45 years ago, you mentioned it earlier, and then con the continuity of that. And now that they're, they're great, they're, they're grandchildren and having them be followers. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful way to live, to realize that whatever you're doing, it's not for everyone, but it might be helping a little bit of the corner of the universe. Right. I so appreciate you sharing that because you, you have basically, you're stood, you've stood the test of time. Your ideas, your, what you've learned, your wisdom, the fact that we are rereading your books, that we are reading your books, that we are sharing your books over decades tells us all that this is, you are the real deal. This is possible. To feel this content and happy and joyful is possible. This is a great place for us to take a brief intermission because we have much more to talk about and share. And what I... I'm excited for you to hear on the other side of this 30 second intermission is she's going to talk about her idea of contentment versus happiness. And I will share mine briefly in our conversation. So you have a recap of that. And then she's going to dive into it and she's going to bring with her the experience of longevity as well as navigating the death of her beloved husband and I'll let her talk about that. And on that topic, she's going to share ideas for how to improve happiness in our everyday lives. As well as she is someone who has traveled to France quite frequently. And we will not miss talking about our shared love for this, <laughs> for this culture. She's going to talk about the French way of being as well as grace. She uses the term grace and grace notes a lot. And readers of her books will no doubt know this and recognize this. And so we'll have a conversation about what grace means to her. And as you'll hear her response, what I hear is someone talking about moments of awe. And as she points out, you're only able to capture or witness or experience these moments of grace when you are present. And she gives some beautiful examples of that. She's also going to mention from time to time a woman named Alyssa. And just to give reference, Alyssa is her professional assistant or personal assistant who is, as she will talk about, is also an artist who Alexander greatly admires. But that is who she is referencing when she says Alyssa. But first, here is a 30-second intermission to go grab another pour for your cuppa, to snuggle in a little bit more, to let the dog out, the cat out, whatever you need to do so that you can tune back in. Because this latter half is one I think you're going to enjoy. Remember how we always end with a petit plaisir at the end of each episode? Um, Alexander Stoddard is a unique guest for this question to be asked, and I appreciate how she approaches it. But first, a 30-second intermission. Back to my conversation with Alexandra Stoddard. I guess as, as someone who is looking to you and going, okay, I'm just starting on this journey. I feel contentment in my life now. It took me a while to get here. It took me a while. I had, there were some no's, a lot of no's I had to say to get to where I'm at. But now I look to you and go, okay, so she's done it and is doing it. A lot of my readers, the, the idea of contentment and, and happiness and contentment are related. I always like to say they're related. They're not the same, but they are both very much related. 
Let's talk about that. Well, yeah, I would love to hear your different differentiation between happiness and contentment. Because my, my differentiation is contentment is something you carry with you every single day in the highs and the lows. It's what keeps you steady and at ease. Happiness are those wonderful moments that you are more present to see. And so therefore you see more of them and experience more of them because you are content. But what is your definition and what is your experience? I w- after Peter died, so Peter Brown and I were married 40 years four months and four days, he died a happy death. He had a good life and a good death. I was holding his hand in bed. He died of natural causes because he was, he was 92 and a half. And the half is very important because we celebrated big time. We went to France for 21 days just before months before he died. He was in the dying process, but he was living fully every single minute. And and that is something to meditate over and to be mindful about that he lived a beautiful life and he lived a beautiful death and 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 I admire him so deeply and love him so dearly and I'm guided by him so completely and I want to tell you that people are misinformed and they are not fully aware of how beautiful it can be to love and have your love grow after death. Because you know the person, you don't have the physical body to to um, distract you. And in the physical decay, when they get older, and they, Peter would fall down a lot because he, his body was falling, and he, he was, couldn't see very well. But that's, that's incidental. His soul was beautiful. And so you, you, you have this purity. The way I don't think people, people don't see God, but they have this vision of God or somebody else or some other divine power. Or something. But we have, the, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of ability to become wise and become illuminated in our, in our, in our lifetime, in our physical lifetime. And I think that Peter, he became enlightened. He was not afraid of death or anything, but he, he became enlightened. And I think I, I was able to be present to, for that divinity that I felt in, in him. This, yes, this illumination that very, is very rare. And, of course, I was so blessed to be so intimate with him and, and for so many years. But we were friends for forever, and so he's been the hugest part of my life because – I knew him. He was a friend. Anyway, there's too much about my personal history, but all I can say is people must understand that just because you're old does not mean that, and living alone does not mean that you have to be lonely. But more than half of the people in this country, in the world, are, I mean, Americans, are lonely now. And it's an epidemic, and it's very, very scary. And the, um, it's just there's a new book called Together that came out two years ago, but it's very exciting because we we have to learn to 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 reach out and be with other people and not be lonely, and 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 know how important our human connections are. And the pandemic really hurt. Well, and that's powerful because I think loneliness is is not dependent upon who we surround ourselves as far as we can be lonely with people. It's a matter of the quality of the connection. As you just shared, you and Peter had a a very profoundly powerful and soul deep connection. And that that makes the difference, right? Right. But you could if you don't if you don't have a connection to yourself, if if you don't really like to be alone. How you'd be very lonely where you're, you'd be very lonely with other people. What do you have to give? You, oh, you, there you go. You give from That's yourself. It. That's it. What you you give, give from a full, from a full heart and soul. I, 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 I know that a lot of people are afraid to be alone. They don't want to face themselves. And I understand that. That's true. But it's very, very lonely yeah. to run out and go to a bar and, and think that you're going to, the person sitting next to you is going to be wise and wonderful and uplift you. I mean, you can have two more drinks and feel <laughs> awful the next day. I mean, really, and truly, you do it to yourself. You know, you know, spare me. 
but but all I all I want to say, uh, 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 the, I mean, I'm I'm all over the place. So happy to be with you because I feel that you are spreading this positive message. If anybody will listen, that, that you can be happy. All I want to go back to the contentment and the happiness thing. So I, I'm giving this lecture. John Hop, John's office. Peter just died, and I go down there for a happiness retreat. They first asked me to give a lecture. And then they got so excited about my coming that they said, well, how about the whole weekend? So we spent a whole weekend, and, and it was different activities. I went to the hospital, saw the patients, I saw the, went to the meetings with the doctors and the nurses, and, and it, was, it was a happiness retreat. And there was a woman that, that, that was in the audience that was um, very old. I think she was, was about 88 years old. And she was in the back, she had white hair, and she was very pretty, but she um, she raised her hand when I said, I don't want to just be, can't be, be content, I want to be happy. Your idea of contentment is a little bit different than mine, and I want to share that with you. No, please do. Content. So she said, she said I, I said, I don't want to just be content. She raised her hand, and I called on her, and she said, Alexandra, you're wrong. I'm a vet, veterinar veterinarian. And she said, cows know how to be content, and they're smarter than human beings. Human beings make, make a mess of their lives very often because they, they, they think negative thoughts. When a cow is, you know, has a, they, they graze, they, they're happy, and they're content. And so now I, I, like, I like the contentment idea that is with you all the time. You have to, in other words, be content. Be content with what you have. Yeah not what you don't have or can't have. There you go. There you go. Now, now letting go is letting go of, oh, I wish you'd done that. I wish I'd done that. I wish I could. I Wishing about something that you can't change because you can't change the past. Right, right, right. And hoping for something. I mean, this is just so simplistic, but it's so true. Hoping for something and, and not, not, not living the life that leads you to what you want, but thinking that it's just going to happen, the magical thinking, that doesn't work either. Right. And we cannot control anything about an hour from now or two hours from now or two years from now. So how about how about uh, our talking about contentment is with you all the time? Happiness is a choice. Yeah. So contentment is a way of, of just... Traveling. A, what did you say? I would say traveling. It's our mode of operant. Uh, yeah, it's a way of traveling. It's yeah. A, yeah, yeah, it's a way of traveling. Mm -hmm. Okay. The way our, our, as human beings, we walk with our two feet. There you go. One in front of the other. There you go. The, way, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. There you go. So it's accumulative. So happiness is, we. Uh, this is absolutely scientific. I'm not a scientist, but I am a scientist because I, I care to not have just fantasy and opinion i want truth and, and something that's provable in terms of in terms in, in terms of of happiness we are born with a certain potential now the good news is that we have neoplasticity and so we can have we can improve we are we feed our brain with our mind and our soul and and our spirit so if we want to be happy if we really choose it and really choose it, then we have to do take steps to, to, to lead us closer to that. And and the good news is that 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 that's why I talk about being a sensualist and 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 being sensual because through our five senses and our sixth sense, our intuition, we can improve our happiness. And we talked about that at the very, the very beginning by the people we surround ourselves with, the choices we make, the work we choose to do. If we're doing something that's going to help the environment, we're going to feel better about ourselves. If we eat the proper food that's going to nourish our body, because our body houses our soul, we're going to feel better about ourselves. I don't mean that I don't eat ice cream every day or chocolate. I'm not saying that. So you have to have your trees, but 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 the, as a basic way of being, we have to be mindful, and that's why it's so exciting to to think that 
that we can we can make the choices that make us happier. So happiness is not the aha moments, the the way you in, implied a little bit that it's the little like happy birthday, happy. No, happiness is a skill. It's cultivated by you and me every single day by what you do, what you don't do, the thoughts that you have, and and every single action, because. Talk is cheap. Money is action. I mean, action is 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 the is a, I, I'm not saying. No, this is making sense, and I appreciate it. You're saying it well. I get you. I'm hearing you. Happiness is 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 not only to be cultivated, but it's it's a, a it's, it's an achievement. There you go. There you go. So so you can be ha- You don't have to say that you're happy all the time. Woo! With a smiling face. <laughs> It's it's who you are. There you go. It's 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 your energy. There you go. Yeah. And you know people that are happy, or you don't. Yeah. And some people can be happy because something happened to them, and somebody was nice to them, or somebody came to visit. Yeah. That's wonderful. But that you'd be a yo-yo. You'd be up and down all the time. Right. Happiness, it, 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 sustaining happiness, happiness over a lifetime. Is something that that is interesting to really talk about and get into in depth because I believe that it is what you do, what you don't do, what you think, what you do, what you what you commit yourself to. It's a certain way, and 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 and, and happiness. I I <coughs> I believe that happiness uh, not only improves your health. Mm-hmm. But but you you need less money. You, you preventative medicine is better than you, you, taking care of yourself is better than being really sick and having all these things. No, it's it's and it's been proven by science as you've talked about neuro, neurologically, but also there's been all sorts of studies that prove that when we when we have different neurons firing, different uh, energy and oxytocin and all those different things that are positive influences in our physical body actually affect our physical health um, because our body isn't super stressed. And so if we're not in that state of chronic stress, then we actually are being kind and being treating our bodies well. And that begins with our minds. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, your love of tea and tea rituals because you're speaking, your listeners from around the world are listening and a lot of us enjoy a good cuppa. Um, You have an affection for tea and you have shared that you schedule at least one moment of tea in your own company every single day, if not more than one, which I love because I drink my tea religiously constantly, I swear. Um, I want to share a few things you've written about tea and how powerful it is. You share, when we sip tea, we are on our way to serenity. We can use tea to infuse our soul with more sacredness. Tea can symbolize an expanded, open mind. It can be an invitation to participate in a celebration of life that connects us to the universal form and beauty. It can expand our consciousness, and it helps our soul to to ripen. And then you conclude, and I love this conclusion, you say, Serenity and contentment are the result of this transformed awareness, which comes from these rituals of tea. How does tea foster such a feeling of calm and contentment? What is it about tea? I think it, a lot of it's what we, what our perception of it. It, it, there are tea masters. It's always an experience. The, 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 the wise, the wise people make a tea celebration and it's always well ordered it's 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 a, it's about living a beautiful life you have a tea celebration you can have a celebration by yourself but the tea master pours the there's a there's a novice that comes and wants to become wise and he comes to see the tea master and the tea master pours the cup and pours the tea all over and makes a big sloppy mess and he and, and the, the, the novice says why 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 did you do that and and the master says because you you were so full of yourself your teacup was already full so in other words you have to empty yourself empty and be full and that's what tea does to you it's an empty vessel and you have to steep your tea for five minutes 
You, you, it's a ritual, and it's beautiful, and you, and, and it's sacred, and it's a moment of being, and, and that's what it, it's a meditation. So uh, I, I, I have a friend that has high tea. I mean, I don't eat, have to eat twenty five sweets when I'm having tea, <laughs> but it's sort of sweet, sort of sweet to to think that. I mean, I like to just put a tea bag in sometimes and have a friend over, but a tea bag versus loose tea doesn't really matter. It's just the idea that you're going to do it. Ritual of it. I mean, do you, I, I, I'm not opposed to tea bags. Are you? Nope. No, I'm not. I have both. I have loose and tea bags. And it's- I, have, I have cans and cans and cans, you know, yeah. cans of tea. But, yeah. but sometimes the tea bag seems to be what I want. There you go. So there you, you go. sometimes you have a, but it, it's, it's, it's all, it's so beautiful because it's not just here. Because when we're meditating, we, we, we let our mind just go, goes in every direction it wants to go in. But it's, 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 it's something deep inside our soul that is, is, is important to pay attention to. There you go. It's that being. You speak of the idea of being rather than doing. And tea really slows us down. Let's us it just... slows us down. We don't gulp. We don't gulp tea. That's true. That's we, true. We sip it. That's a good point. Um, you share in. Um, I love. I love this. this. Is one of my favorite books. This is one of my favorite. Books. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. I, I. It's written up like crazy. But um, you share a lot of your favorite teas um, in that. Um, but I love that you just say whatever you whatever you have whatever you can do make this a ritual. It's something that's valuable whether it's with yourself or with others. Um, but I, I'm so grateful that you were talking about tea. I often don't hear Americans talking about tea, to be honest. It's usually, as you spoke about, um, Japanese or, um, English in my experience has been my English tea drinking, but we don't hear it in America. And I'm grateful that you talked about it a little bit. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm grateful too, because I went to tea houses all over this beautiful country and people I had in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, a woman gave a tea party for me outside and she used for flowers she used teapots and and had this the, the top from the teapot uh, next to it so it was a, absolutely shibui adorable and then all the guests that came brought their favorite teacup but didn't use it for themselves use it for somebody else so everybody got to have other people's teacups and saucers i mean it was so so sweet and and uh, people people love tea, believe me. I, I mean, it was wonderful. And 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 it, again, grandmas love to have tea with their grandchildren. <laughs> it's something that you just pass on. It's a ritual. It's a celebration. It's a ceremony. There you go. It's a celebration ceremony. And you speak about a lot of your pictures, your tea pictures and your teapots and your teacups. I actually have a, li- a listener who has a question about this because she's been following you since you began and she's read, she said, read every book and reread, reread a lot of them. Wow. She wants to know that you have started to let go of some of your collections. And she read this in an interview or heard you speak about it. And um, she was wondering how you're able to do that. Number one, it also just, What's that like? Uh, because she knows you have beautiful collections that have a lot of memories because you would pick up teapots and whatnot on your travels, right? They, they, they come with memories. So how is letting go going? And how is that part of content? I think that's part of what we're just talking about here, being able to let go, but not let go of the memory. I am visual. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm essential. So I, I, all my senses are important to me and, and I've, I've developed them to be Come uh, be, become aware of how beautiful they are, but I I have all my memories, and so far I still have some marbles up here. So I'm able to I'm a, I've lived that journey with all my possessions. And so a year and a half ago I had major surgery, and some some people die with surgery, and and I I knew that, and and I was 80 or almost 80. I don't remember exactly right now. But so I, I, I woke up and I realized, oh, my gosh, let's move the bed over to the window so I can see the light and the view. The children came. They brought me flowers. I was in intensive care. And I, and I said, <sighs> and physical possessions, my husband, Peter, said, possessions shouldn't possess you. You know, we're, uh, 
when you when you're 81 and you're an avid collector, I was an art collector. I collected beautiful things, beautiful teacups, saucers, uh, um, teapots. I mean, I when I like something, believe me, I like it a lot. <laughs> and so over the years, wherever I would go on my travels, I'd bring things back from France, England, wherever. We have to talk about France in a minute. But everywhere I would go, no, well, I, I, I would I have to. And, and 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 believe me, my the, everything that I ha all there are memories for everything behind everything. I'd watch the the glass being blown in the south of France and bring things home, and then my child Brooke would go to camp in France, and she would go to the same glass factory and watch the glass being blown and bring home Mama a picture from Viet. I mean, we have all these memories, and they they it's a beautiful thing to have memories. And and I'm very very aware that that the past I've lived so fully and enjoyed it so much. I want to pass on some of my pretty possessions so other people can share the same journey. And believe me, the woman that 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 asks the question, I want her to know that when she's 81 and she has beautiful things, she should pass them on to her friends and her family, and put them out there. But what's wonderful about it is that it frees you so much. I mean, I feel light and airy. I feel angelic because I know that I'm doing the right thing. I don't want to have excess, and it seems excessive because I'm not living the same life I used to live. I'm not, I don't need as many things because I'm not having 40 people for, you know, dinner parties and stuff. I mean, when I lived in New York City and here, and I was, just, I mean, I had a lot of energy, and and it was a different chapter in my life. And <clears throat> now I really like, I I like um, hungering down and having less. And so I've been giving. If anybody follows my website, I've been giving away all the things that I really love, my art and. And, and bringing it back to art gallery so that the collectors that collect the same paintings that I do, the same artists, can can have, you know, add to their collection. And then uh, beautiful porcelains, fruits and vegetables, and they're being sold and at auction. It's very, very exciting. Very exciting. No, thank you for answering that. I think you're going to give a lot of, uh, I think you're going to shift people's perspective on letting go. No, I really, I really want to want to um, add to to, to to her question that 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 uh, I don't want to leave a mess for my children, and 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 it's, and I don't want to take it. I don't. I'm not getting rid of anything that I that I that I love to look at every single day. But when I've had things in closets and the attic, I mean, it's just too much of a beautiful thing, and and so it's it's. Uh, and and uh, and it, 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 it there's there's this book that I've recommended called the Gentle Sweeters Art of Death Cleaning, and it's very very important. It's by an 87 year old woman who had two daughters. I have two daughters. She still has two daughters. She just um, said it takes time. You have to touch everything. But I I you know how wonderful it is when you give something to somebody that you know will enjoy it. It makes you feel so good. You, well, I don't have to go buy, to a store to get a present. I've got things here that I can give. But I, I'm, it's called deaccessioning in in the art world. When you when you when you weed out your collection and then you give you, you pass on and then you can buy other things. I don't right now. I don't have a whole lot of anything. I mean, I have art on the walls and I have pretty things everywhere, but but not too much. And it feels wonderful. It really feels wonderful. And it's quite easy. Once you get going, you can't stop. <laughs> no, I love, I really appreciate you sharing this. And, and, and to me, I'm, I'm hearing you share this and it's an act of mindfulness. Again, you're, you're still applying the same skills, but now uh, it's a different part of the journey and you are applying mindfulness so that you can be at peace and also bring joy to others. Yes. Um, as well as you just said yourself, yes. you feel lighter, you feel, yeah, yes. I think you're a testament to what you've been teaching all of us for so long. Okay. You mentioned France. And as you know, many people that listen to this show are Francophile. I'm a Francophile. And I know, as you mentioned in your books and also in our conversation, that you've traveled to France and specifically Provence. Um, my question is, how have your experiences in France 
foster this feeling that of how to live well? What is it about the French culture that spoke to you and you brought home and into your life um, in the everyday? They love life. They love, they, 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 they love the ritual of eating beautifully. They take their time. They, they walk. They want to see everything. They, they, they hang out in cafes. I mean, they, I, I, I think I'm, I think I'm French in disguise. I love the joie de vivre. I mean, the, the, the love of life. And I, that's why I collected French art because all my, the artists, I, I like to know the artists that I'm collecting. I have some English watercolors, but, and I like, I, I, but I, I don't have anything in my house that's hanging on the wall that's not um, painted by somebody that became a friend. Oh, so. oh really? Oh, wow. That's yeah, and, and most of my art is, is French. Most of my art is, is by French artists. And, and so one particularly, and I got to know him when I was very young. I was 19 years old. My mother bought my first painting for me and said, I hope this is going to turn out to be a collection, dear. And it, <laughs> was, it, it did. And, and he became a dear, dear friend. And he died in 2008. And and uh, I he had an exhibition in New York after he died, and I bought the, the main painting from from his collection that had his date of birth and, and death under it. And it was a big, oh, wow. huge painting, not a huge painting, but a, a painting that defined his last work. And and I have it in my kitchen. Oh, wow. uh, right now it's hanging over over some muffin warmers. I haven't. Uh, I live in an 18th century cottage, and um, it's it's very very thrilling. It's very thrilling to have known and loved a living artist, and to 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 feel the art spirit, and to to uh, be able to uh, be a supporter of his to yeah. to bring his work into into my clients' work, you know, into their homes. Um, so that's very very rewarding for me. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, working with living artists, cause this is their passion. This is their talent. This is their gift, but they have to make a living. So it's a beautiful kind of commingling of passions to enable both of you to do your, to do your thing. I have an artist in my house right now, Alyssa Sweet. That's and right. She, she's, she's, she's painting a mural for, I've, I've seen her other murals. She's painted, uh, she painted a beautiful mural in a bookstore in, um, Providence, Rhode Island, and she took. We had lunch and we had a big celebration. We went there many times. She brings her family there and her friends, and the joy she's bringing to. I get fan letters from people that 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 love Liz's, um love the fact that we had a picture of us on, on my website when I was picture of me in her in in both of. So it, it, it she's you know she's and she she paints beautiful flowers. I mean, she's, and so her energy is, is fabulous. I love being around her because she, she's an artist. I mean, artists live life. Believe me, they see different, they see, they see beauty and everything. Yes. I was going to say, talk about sensuality. They definitely live in their senses. They practice that so well. And we could definitely learn from that. Those of us who are not artists. In one of your books, you and Peter traveled to France one time and you were, I don't know how long you were there, but you came home and you had enjoyed your food. You had enjoyed your meals and you came back and you lost weight. And so it's the idea of seasonality and savoring your food and enjoying the ritual of dining, not rushing it. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, Because there's something just so special every time I've been there too about the life that they live. They're every it's their everyday life. It's their everyday life that just deepens the appreciation of things that we forget about. I have a feeling that you and I are going to go to France together someday. (laughs) I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Yeah, I can't go there enough. Um, But yeah, can you speak? Well, I used to I used to go only with Peter. We never went with other friends or anything. Peter and then the children. And, and, and the children would go when they were very young, we went with children. And then when they got mature and had husbands or anything, we would go with the children, but not they would meet us there or whatever. But we but I didn't go with friends. And when when Peter died, I loved being alone in France. I used to write there, I used to go there by myself. I never 
I, it, it was, I didn't have to be with other people in France because when you're in France, whether you're in Paris or I went to Giverny, to the club, and I love going to Giverny and then taking the train down to Provence. I mean, come on. Or flying into Nice and going backwards up to Paris. But I want to tell you that the French way of being is something that, that we should all try to emulate because they don't rush when they're in a cafe. The, the cafes know that the, 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 the customer is there until the customer wants to leave. It's true. It's, true. It, it's, it's it, of course it's true because my, my, I have a daughter, my younger daughter, Brooke lived there for a year and the, one of the most famous cafes in Paris was her office. I mean, she went down to the phone booth and, and made a phone call because she didn't have an office, but she just was living the life of, 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 you know, artists, writers. I mean, she was, and, and that's, that's really the way that I like to live. I don't like to be time bound. We are as a society, we are right now, people only worry about time, time. Everybody's in a hurry. Have you noticed that on television, things go so fast. If you go on mute and look at the commercials, things are zapping so fast that you, you, you can't possibly concentrate on that. That's just confusion. And, 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 and I think that there's too much uh, emphasis on expedience and saving time, saving, saving, saving. You're not saving time. You're getting nervous and stressful, and then you're racing to the doctor or you're unfortunately taking drugs and, and abusing them, alcohol and not taking care of yourself because you're so so distraught you're out of out of kilter and and chaotic yeah you're not in the times that you're, you're not in the moment and and being being in the moment is all we really that's all uh, we have. No, that's all we have. And you, you reminded me of a quote. You you share actually. You and I spoke on the phone just for listeners to know this. You and I spoke on the phone before our conversation here. So last week, and even in our conversation, you shared this quote with me by Jonathan Swift, and you also have included it in some of your books. And he wrote, "May you live every day of your life." And it's that idea of living it, being present, not rushing not racing, not feeling you have to constantly be doing something. Um, that's one thing I really appreciate about, appreciate about your books. You bring in so many outside experts and sources and research. And as we have here, he's a, he's an essayist and a writer, but you bring in philosophers. What you're learning, your curiosity speaks to me about your curiosity because your curiosity seems to have led you in a very wise, on a very wise path. What is it about curiosity and living well that go hand in hand? I'm I'm curious about everything because I feel I feel that because I didn't go to a formal college, I went to art school and went around the world and I've been studying ever since and before and in between. I I find that the more I read, the more I realize I don't know anything. The more I expand my possibilities of learning about I've been doing a lot of brain research now because I don't know that much about the brain, although I've been studying all the, the, the Dalai Lama's work with the brain and the, the, all these different writers. It's fascinating how, how there's a woman that, that wrote a book, Taylor, Dr. Taylor, about the whole brain. She wants us to understand that the brain has four different characters, the, 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 the feeling and the thinking on left and right hemisphere. And you have to make peace with these four characters because you can't burn out one. You can't just be all one quarter of your brain and, and then burn it out. You've got to keep those cells, you know, multiplying and everything. And it's fascinating. But going back to the Jonathan Swift quote, I get quotes off of fortune cookies. I get them from, I, I, I've had my quotations on tea bags. I mean, I, 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 I am passionate about quotes. The Jonathan Swift quote came from my my dear friend and literary assistant Alyssa, and in a note she always writes me a beautiful note, and usually with a quotation because she knows that I'm a I'm a junkie. I love quotations. You know why? Because they confirm and affirm what I want to say. And who ever heard of Alexander Stoddard? Nobody. But you know what? 
they'll listen if it's Jonathan Swift, or they'll listen if it's their art song. I mean, that's the, that's my little trick. And and Carl Brandt, my literary agent, used to think I was crazy. Talk, use your own words. No, nobody will listen. But if you say, if, so I used to have marginalia. My books were riddled with all these quotes on both sides. And, and, and I, I complained about television being brrr, all the time. But I had, and, and it might have confused the text, but you know what? My readers love it because they're busy and they can just look through one of my books and they can just waft into, the, into their consciousness my, my quotes because they're all good and they're all positive. They are. They are. And, and I've, edited, I, I've edited some people. When I learn bad things about people's character, Years later, that they're, they're they, that they were hypocrites. I I I don't quote them anymore. Oh, you so there's them. some of my early people that I quoted that I don't quote anymore. Oh, that's good. No, we can talk about that another time. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that. No, I do. I love that you have those quotes throughout. And as you said, when I have to disagree with you a little bit because I your quotes are powerful. People know who you are. They respect you. And so when we use your words, you are one of those people that you would quote in your book, but. What, what other people want to include in their writings. Uh, and so I, I appreciate your wit. I have, I have more words in me that will pop out. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I do want to ask this final question. And I have a feeling that the re- listeners and readers are going to go, oh my gosh, I don't know what she's going to share because she shares so much of these ideas throughout her writing. So I always end each episode sharing a petit plaisir and since you are our guest you have the pleasure of sharing a petit plaisir and i will admit all of your books have oodles of petit plaisirs and you've talked about this a little bit you call them grace notes and you include them in all of your books and as you mentioned you have a book titled grace notes but what i'd like you to share with us today is what is a simple pleasure that you enjoy that elevates your every days and this must be this is going to be you have so many, so you can share more than one. What is a simple luxury or simple pleasure you enjoy to elevate your everydays? Having a, a little plastic spray bottle of water and misting my plants and my flowers and looking at them and talking to them, communicating my energy, my happiness with my plants and moving them slightly. And that begins that begins my it's it's part of my meditative moments of solitude and quiet and and that's very important to me uh i have many i oh my have so many i mean we could talk for I days mean, my whole life is a little bit like that it is. you're the first guest where i can say how is she going to choose because she has thousands of examples <laughs> Well, and that's why I definitely want to let listeners know, for those of the listeners who haven't read all of your books, she has so many lovely books. I'll include them on the show notes um, because you do. You share so much inspiration for living well in the everyday and very concrete examples. That's what I appreciate about what you write about. Very concrete, very specific. um, And I think that's what's beautiful about that. Listeners, Alexandra Stoddard's books, many books, are available wherever you shop for your reading material, and it all began with her first, Style for Living. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. You can also learn more about her online at alexandrastoddard.com. Thank you very, very much for your time, Alexandra. Shannon, it's a gift you've given me. Bless you. Thank you. You're so sweet. (laughs) Thank you. I want to thank Alexandra again for taking this time to be on a podcast. She states on her website that she doesn't do a lot of technology with regards to podcasts and and whatnot, but she said yes to this conversation, and I am so grateful. It was unlike a conversation I typically have on here, and so if you are still with us, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it to, to listen to someone who has consciously chosen to live fully, to learn from life, to be a curious being her entire life and continues to do exactly what she has written about, um, has given me great pause, but also a lot of ahas. And sometimes when we encounter something that 
we haven't seen very often or experienced very often. And I say that with regards to being around someone such as Alexandra, who has lived life so fully for so long and still continues to have a, I want to say childlike enthusiasm and joy for, for, for life and for learning and I mean, before I even started recording the conversation, she was looking at my bookshelf behind me going, what's on your bookshelves? I love looking at books. I mean, she was full of questions for me and for someone who is held in such high esteem and who I, I was, I was honest, I'll be honest. I was very, I didn't sleep well the night before. I was a little nervous for this interview because I hold her in high regard. And so to be with someone who was that curious and that energetic with regards to what I was doing, even though she has lived a full, full life, seen the world in so many different ways and done so many different things and written so many books and had such great success. It was one of those moments where I said, this is a skill she has honed and it is a choice and it is making a tremendously powerful, positive difference. And it is an energy that you're drawn to. And again, I was still not expecting it because I had my unconscious bias that this is not how how an 81-year-old, mind you, a 91-year-old, whoever, should be acting. And I say that word should with air quotes. It's what we've become accustomed to. And it need not be that way. Life can be this exciting adventure for our entire lives. So indeed, this conversation was refreshing. It was inspiring. And I want to thank Alexandra again for sharing what she has discovered along her journey and as she continues to journey. So again, she continues to teach through example, through her words, but also by continuing to be a student of life who genuinely loves living. And I want to thank her for continuing to teach and to have allowed not only myself, but the listeners of this show to be students for the past hour and a half. I will have on the show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 359, a list of all of her books, a link to her website, and, and anything else we shared in this conversation. Thank you for tuning in today. And on the 21st of June will be our next new episode. And we're going to talk about love. I'll leave it at that. Until then, I'll see you on the blog. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL tsll.co or the simplyluxuriouslife.com. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, pick up my new book, which became both a bestseller and number one new release in France Travel, The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment, available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening. My first book, titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, and my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate, the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Cup of Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British Weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog posts, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. 
There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour.